this issue mm-hmm. of integrity of our news and journalist institutions is really interesting to me oh, it's because huge. I've grown up in an environment where mm-hmm. it's assumed not to trust what news reporters say verbatim. But mm-hmm. even in addition to that, to for some news outlets to uh, almost approach them as if what they're saying is already wrong, right? Right, right. And um, yeah, it used to be that that you knew that what you were reading was what had a certain bias. Yeah, you know, Christian Science Monitor covered this well, but not this, and New York Times this. Uh, and you would get more stories because it was New York and it was more Jewish. You would get more stories about the Holocaust. L.A. Times would be more entertainment. Def- you know, yeah. you knew that, but you never you never believed they were making something up. And again, if they found errors, they corrected errors. Mm-hmm. But it was sort of like, you know, they plowed different fields. They were kind of good at doing certain things. And in France, you know, there's all kinds. Of, they, there's more of a spectrum of conservative, liberal, moderate. Newspapers are that way uh, in Germany and so forth. So, yeah, you knew what you were getting. Yeah. But you didn't think it, you didn't not trust it. Yeah. And I think there's such a stark difference in the way people from older generations versus newer generations consume political information. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, just given American culture and they're not being really like elderly people that people sort of congregate around and and speak with, there's sort of like a broken communication channel. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, you know, being young, it seems like the quality of news reporting shifted from establishment news outlets to places where decentralized reporters would congregate and were allowed to post their content and yeah in regards to like the political news consumption of my generation there seems to be this really cool and disruptive and innovative sort of dynamic going on in news journalism where Mm -hmm. platforms like Substack or YouTube, there's decentralized creators that don't have to deal with the sort of perverse and sensitive structures of big establishment news media outlets. Mm -hmm. And their integrity is based on sort of their very well-documented track history of reporting. Mm -hmm. And although sort of the, the, the kinks of what this new sort of political news ecosystem looks like are still being worked out, Mm -hmm. it's made me not feel as pessimistic about where news journalism is headed versus older folks that I think may not be familiar with sort of this emerging. Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, Woodward and Bernstein that that um, revealed the Nixon escapades leading up to Watergate. It's a journal? Uh, they're journalists. Okay. Yeah. Robert Woodward and Carl Bernstein of the Washington Post. So they, they tracked Walt Watergate and all the machinations there. They had editors, again, these old people who from World War One, World War II, and the publishers, right, looking over their shoulders all the time, because the issue here was getting rid of a president of the United States. And back then, a president of the United States was like God. I mean, Lyndon Johnson, John F. Kennedy, FDR, you know, y- you didn't just, even, even, even Trump, look how hard it is to kill off Trump. He's got 91 indictments, and he's got half the country. It's like, right? So... Um, they bird dogged them, everything that they did, all of their sources, check and double check and go back and so forth. And it isn't that I don't think a younger journalist doesn't have that ethic. I think anyone who's drawn to journalism is of that same breed. But when you had newspapers making more money, right, selling advertisement and affording to have a journalist in Europe, you know, what they'll do now is they'll fly a journalist out. They'll have a satellite grabbing some information. They subcontract with the journalists. But the old newspapers and even the, even the television, they had journalists who lived and breathed and ate in Germany or France and could report that way. And that's different, right? Speaking the language, blending in all of those things. They could afford that. They can't afford those things. They can't afford as many reporters. They can't afford editors. You know, the Wall Street Journal, as much as I hate the Wall Street Journal, used to write incredibly long f- form articles on regulations, right? I mean, this is a very conservative paper that doesn't like regulation, right? Get out of the way, get out of the way, government. You're keeping me from making profits. But they were fantastic. You couldn't argue with their facts, right? Their theory, you could question, but they were working from the same facts that we're all working from today, mm. right? You know, Mother Jones or the nation, you know, more liber- the Atlantic might have a little more liberal leaning, might have a different view. But again, it was the same facts, same census data. And that's what's changing now is they're creating out of thin air numbers and no one has the time to check it. It's such a rapid fire dispensing of lies that you can I mean, there is a, the group that tracks Trump's lies, you know, the 11,392 in the first thousand days, you know, and, and I look at that every now and then I'm like, I'm so inured to it because I got tired after the seventh lie. You know, the first day of his administration was, oh, my crowds were bigger than Obama's, which 
was a complete fabrication and lie. It was a lie if you looked at the turnstile data from subways in Washington, D.C. to the aerial photography. It just, it mm -hmm. was, and they kept pushing it, and social media kept, kept it alive. Even the New York Times is being criticized now for keeping alive, you know, this both both sides view like you know maybe trump is right on something here or you know it's like ah, okay well we're talking about the facts here you know and this is why factual information this is why i emphasize demographics so much in my classes on marketing because you know i have no idea 10 years now or 15 years from now what's going to be out there but i know that whatever sites are going to be out there are going to be thinking about this age group of this gender or this gender identification uh and that's going to determine what they do. And the more you study demographics, you know, okay, Reddit appeals to this and Pinterest here, and should Pinterest go after more women or it's already 80%, is it saturated? Should it go to men? You know, what should it do? Should it stick to its knitting? Should it, you know, these are the kinds of things that you have to know. Mm -hmm. Big demographic movements to kind of protect yourself from the outright lies. So you can't study it enough as far as I'm concerned. I'm curious what you think about this hypothesis in regards to trying to reconcile where this journalist ethic may have um, left mm. establishment media news outlets. I heard you mention earlier that, you know, when you'd watch the news back then, a lot of those guys were veterans, right? Yeah. So they they saw some shit, right? At a young age. Yeah. And <laughs> so. that affected, it, it, it sort of like instilled this sense of like, you know, I'm going to live a life of integrity. I've right. seen what the repercussions of reckless um, behavior from a person yeah. that has power looks like. And I know what bad is. Breaking yeah. news is dropping a bomb. Breaking news is Normandy. Breaking news isn't, you know, Miley Cyrus got married. Yeah. And I guess yeah. the hypothesis is, and you also mentioned the sort of dynamic of like uh, academic institutions having these deferred MBA programs or these MBA programs where you sort of make a person sort of like a weapon of capitalism at a very young age, it, right, right? Right, right. What do you think about the hypothesis that maybe what went wrong is, you know, the people that saw some shit, right, and then started working in journalism sort of died out. Yeah, right. And the new generation, I'm reluctant to use the word cesspool, but it was sort of like a cesspool of very privileged people that got the in through ha going to this academic institution. And were really disconnected with what breaking news actually meant and maybe didn't have, were operating under an incentive structure where their much less resilient integrity couldn't overcome the challenges of navigating that incentive structure. Well, I th like I say, with editors going away, with more reporters going away, with the infrastructure and oversight, with that kind of going away of print journalism, um, it, it wasn't like, you know, the inmates are running wild now. It, it wasn't that. Because, again, I do believe that the fundamental integrity of a kid your age that wants to go into journalism is the same of Woodward and Bernstein, is the same of Walter Cronkite from that era. I, I really believe that. Now, you have all these tools now for summoning up data immediately that if you were a reporter 50 years ago, you'd have to go to the reference library or there'd be a library maybe in the newspaper to get some basic demographics. Mm -hmm. You do have more at your disposal, but you have to have that fundamental knowledge of, you know, putting it together, putting it together quickly, putting it together in a way that makes sense. You know, if you don't have to worry about grammar and syntax because you were raised with Twitter and texting all the time, you're not going to craft a really good sentence. That is a problem. I think quality of writing has really, really declined. Yeah. yeah I have a friend at, at Harvard, and I had lunch with her one time when I was, this is back in like 1979, and she was taking a writing class, and she was a f phenomenal writer. And she's like, God, I have this instructor, and it's like, I thought I would have written, you know, 10 things by now, but she's having me rewrite this one thing that I did like five or six times. So you're starting with a brilliant, great writer all the time, but they're being forced to just shorten this thing and repackage it you know, and making it, um, you know, uh, uh, moving, moving parag paragraphs around, um, inductive versus deductive, all these kinds of changes. But that's really how you become a better writer. Mm -hmm. But who, who has the time to do that anymore? How many teachers are saying, like, I, I assigned four presentations. If, what, I would sh what I should have done is assign that in the beginning and then ed had you guys edit it down to five or six. Because when you make a presentation in the real world, no one has time to get 20 slides done. You get two slides in and some jerk wants to be the smartest person in the room and will shut you down. Mm. So I kind of did you a disservice by thinking the world can get away with 40 slides when really, you know, you got to get your point across much more quickly. Yeah. You know, and... You know, look at The Guardian, look at what they do with data science. There's incredible graphic work and data display that never existed. The New York Times was always good with graphics, but it was hard and expensive to do. And now you really have the power to put together really great graphics that the other generations didn't have. But you still have to know the right question to ask. 
you know, the problem with, with data is that, God, you create these dashboards. And remember, we talked about correlations and the mm-hmm. danger of correlations, like, you know, the price of tea in China can be related to the price of diapers in Pakistan, and it can be a 0.9 correlation, but it's totally meaningless who would ever look at these things. Yeah. That is a problem in journalism, too. What are you going to show people? What do you want them to walk away with? You, you don't want to simplify things and dumb them down too much. And you want to say, well, this is causality. I think this is causing this. And to you know, defend that and, and develop that yeah. in an essay kind of sense. Thank you.